Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Very excited and proud to introduce Mr. Robert Dobeck, Director of Golf Course Maintenance for JC Resorts. Mr. Dobeck is the, also the former president of the San Diego Golf Course Superintendents Association. He's uh, been the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award within that association. He's also the construction manager on the uh, creation and construction of Del Mar Country Club, Twin Oaks Golf Course, Encinitas Ranch Golf Course, and uh, Arrowwood Golf Course as well. Uh, Mr. Dobek has also had general management experience as the general manager of Mount Woodson Golf Course, and he is also a graduate of Bowling Green State University. Mr. Dobek, welcome to the Catalyst webinar series. Thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you, John, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm proud to be here today to, uh, to give this talk a little bit about golf maintenance, about something near and dear to me. Before we begin, a couple quick things. If my voice has a little bit of a crack to it, uh, I'm going through the uh, seasonal allergy system. And um, what's interesting is after all the years of being in this business, uh, I went to the allergist and she told me the, uh, the number one allergy I have is against grasses. So it's kind of a unique position to be in. And for you that have poanya on your golf course right now, uh, you can probably see a few seed heads floating around and that's, that causes me a lot of trouble. Uh, before we get started, also, I'd like to encourage everyone to make this interactive session, to ask questions if you'd like. Uh, I'd certainly be more than happy to address any issues you may have specifically uh, to your golf course, if, if possible, or just overall knowledge, something that interests you in some of the videos we see today. If you're interested in that, we can, uh, we can further elaborate on all that. So anyway, if we take a look at the uh, agenda this morning, too far. So yes, my game again is Bob Dobeck. I'm the Corporate Director of Golf Maintenance for JC Resorts. My position, I oversee the maintenance at 11 courses, 10 of them in Southern California and one in New Mexico. Of course, I have a superintendent at each property that maintains the day-to-day -day efforts and, uh, and works closely with me on, on projects and, and all, the, all the other golf course maintenance items we go through. I've been in the business now 40 years with this turf grass thing and uh, 22 years with JC Resorts. And believe me, I've seen a lot of change over the years in the business side of it, um, with more and more agency reporting, more emphasis obviously on profits, uh, profit margins. And as we get to, in my role as in public golf, it's always something we're, we're focused on and moving forward. I first cut my teeth in the business with uh, the Singing Hills Golf Course down in uh, El Cajon, California. And I worked with a gentleman named Dave Fleming, who was then an inspiring and, and young and, and professional superintendent who gave me the opportunity to learn the business under his direction. What's interesting there is the sidelight to that is that uh, the PGA professional at the time is someone that your na the name you may recognize. It's Tom Mattis. Tom was the golf pro and worked together with, with Dave there down at Singing Hills. I've also been involved, as we said earlier, in six courses uh, construction as either the construction manager or the uh, owner's representative, which I oversee the project for the owner's interest. Now my role has changed a little bit as far as, uh, as, as far as I go. I'm now more, I would consider, a consultant to our 11 golf courses. Uh, with the experience I've had, I've seen a lot. and in, in this industry, you never see it all. But I have seen a lot, and, and I work with the young superintendents, training them, going through their different uh, projects and whatever conditions we're dealing with at every, every different course. And believe me, every course has their own. I'd like to start off today by talking a little bit about relationships between the PGA Pro and the superintendents. You know, when I first got into this business, it wasn't always the best relationship. Um, it wasn't always good. I heard things from sometimes from professionals saying, oh, you just make tall grass shorter. Um, there were arguments about carts on cart path after a rain event. There were all kinds of, of different uh, discrepancies between how they managed the golf course and how they'd like to see the, man the golf course managed. 
but I think over time it, it changed a little bit. And some of the reasons it changed, I think, were the bullet point number two, new demands on the golf course conditions. We started to get into an era, and I think a lot of you will remember, that we used to mow greens at 7.30 seconds, quarter inch, with the stint meter rolling about seven, eight, maybe a tops. But as the, golf, the game of golf grew and we started seeing more TV coverage and beautiful conditions and, of course, uh, the best conditions that, that you can have at some of the top courses in the country, there became a new, new uh, demand on quality of conditions. And I think that was the start of, of how golf has evolved to where it's at. Today, we're mowing greens sometimes under a tenth of an inch, rolling at speeds 11, 12, and even 13 at some of the high-ranking events. Well, what happened was I think it gave a new focus towards that, and I think the relationship started to turn a little bit at that point where pros and superintendents started to get together. But the big part came, I think, when the competitive markets came in. As many of you know, we have a, a, a vast amount of golf courses that were built in Southern California back in the 90s, uh, a lot of them tied to the home uh, projects, uh, a lot of them tied to developments that in, and had have green space, and they thought a golf course would be a, a viable uh, measure to do. And it was. It was a great. Uh, it was a great start. Golf was growing leaps and bounds. But all of a sudden, we found ourselves overbuilt and in a very competitive market. And I think that's really where we changed our thinking between the superintendent and pro. They now became what I would consider the bullet point teammates for the property. I think everybody's realized now, and especially as superintendents, we realize it takes the both of the perform, to perform to be successful at the property. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of competitive things going on in the industry. There's cost, as you may know, some courses now shut, starting to shut down. It has become very, 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 very competitive out there, and conditions and and teamwork is is probably the highest point ever. At JC, one of the things we do is we combine the superintendent the pro every week for a weekly formal meeting. When I say formal, it's not walk in and say, hey, how's it going, Joe? Good, how are you doing? Good, everything okay? Yeah, it's fine, see you later. We have them sit down and talk to each other every week on a weekly basis where the professional will talk about the past revenues of the week and maybe the future revenues coming in. And the golf course superintendent will talk more about uh, his projects, what he has going on, what conditions or what uh, projects that might happen or cultural practices that we may be doing this week that may affect play. And I think that that gives the superintendent not only uh, an idea of what's going on, what he can expect to, to hear and see from his, from his clientele, from his customers. So I think that that relationship has truly evolved into one where I know at JC Resorts has become a team and, and a lot of them get along very, very well and they realize that they're working for a common, common goal and that is for the profitability and the success of the project. I don't know if there's any questions, but again, if you, as you have questions, please feel free to, to put them in. Next slide we go to is our, my, one of my favorite ones is airification and cultural practices. That's my favorite subject because I'm a, I'm a firm believer in it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the golfing public's not a big fan of, of any kind of cultural practices that go on in the golf course. One of the things that I hear a lot is, is, is when I walk into pro shops sometimes and the customers might say, hey, the greens are perfect, and now here you come, and now you're airifying. And to us, you know, why would you do that? Why would you tear these greens up? Why, they're, they're really good right now. But I think what most people don't understand is what it takes to maintain quality conditions. And I think that uh, is the bullet point number one, the benefit of cultural practices uh, is simply improved turf quality. When we're doing anywhere from, you know, maybe 20, 30,000 rounds in the private side to maybe 50, hopefully 50 to 60,000 in the public side, it takes the quality of, of, of soil and to produce and, and practices to produce this quality turf that allows us to keep conditions, uh, good conditions year round. There's a there's secret to, the only secret to plant health is like anything else. There's three things the plant needs. It needs air, it needs water, and it needs food. And when I talk about air, I don't only mean the air that we, surrounds us that we breathe every day, but also the air underneath the root system because if there's no air in that root system, in that under that soil, those roots will not flourish, the plant will not get strong, and we'll be battling a lot of conditions. Some of this we'll talk about as in the future slides. But cultural practices 
uh, whether it's verticutting, airification, all those are very, very necessary to keep the quality of it. I know what happens though in the golf shops, I and mean, the word airification becomes a very nasty word, and people are running the other way when they hear it on if you have to tell them over the phone. But under airification, certain times of year are, uh, are more applicable to, to do the airification. We at JC try to do it between two to three times a year. Now, when I say two to three, for sure two, but sometimes we go three depending on what kind of soil conditions we've had, depending what the property, what the greens makeup is. A lot of the older courses uh, before the USGA came in with the greens, the greens mix and the greens program, uh, went with push-up greens where they used a lot of native soil or maybe some, some loamy soil and, um, and it lends itself to a lot more compaction and not much drainage. So in those situations, we usually will go with uh, three times a year. Um, airification does a couple of good, three good, four good things really. It removes thatch, which is a, is a, a breeding ground for disease, uh, stops drainage, uh, doesn't allow water to percolate. Uh, compaction, where the soil gets so tight that there there is no air in the soil and there's no room for there's nothing for the roots to breathe and and move to, uh, and, and get stronger. Um, drainage, just water moving through the soil profile. Uh, you don't want water hanging up near the top le levels, and because the compaction uh, would cause that, the drainage gets stopped, and all of a sudden uh, you're almost drowning the plant. Uh, oxygen, as I mentioned earlier, it's it's very important for the root structure to have ox oxygen and also to be able for that root system to breathe. And then also when the sand goes in, you're providing a new growing medium for those roots to really stretch out and get strong. So those are the benefits of that. Uh, the green zerifications options. Uh, we at JT Resorts have, have looked at all sides because we know as a public golf, uh, when the word airification comes off, uh, people run the other way. They say, oh, no thanks, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. So what we've introduced is, which is coming a little more common out there, is the half green airification. And the half green airification is uh, a process where you actually will pick a half, whether it's the front half or back half, uh, and airify just one half of the green, leaving the other half good for putting quality, good for uh, 30 to 40 foot putts that everybody can rely on. It's going to be on a quality, quality surface. Uh, it's worked well in some of our operations where we have a large, large greens because we almost treat it as a two separate greens. Um, and the revenue numbers have proven to show that it, it works in that respect. However, there are some there are some definite disadvantages to it. Number one, it does include a lot of wear and tear on the good half of the green. So they're putting the pin position consistently in that area for up to 14 days. It does take, and sometimes even longer, uh, could be 17 to 20 days, and you get a lot of wear and tear on that lower level or the level that hasn't been aerified. The other dis, uh, disadvantage is when you are out there uh, playing golf, uh, you know, we might have a putt that is bumpy at the first half, smooths out and goes to the hole. Some people didn't really, didn't really enjoy that factor of it as well. From an agronomic side or from our side, uh, when you top dress half the green, uh, you have sand that goes in the holes, you're dragging, you're trying to fill those, you're rolling. But invariably, sand gets to the good side, and all of a sudden, you're mowing the good side with a different mower, and uh, you're ruining blades, you're ruining uh, bed knives, so there's a lot more maintenance in the equipment when you do that. The other thing, uh, as far as agronomics go, is just the inconsistency in the irrigation. When you have uh, good drainage after a, a newly aerified uh, green versus the other half that hasn't been aerified yet, uh, you do have a little bit of problem trying to make the greens consistent with, with your watering pattern. And that sometimes can be somewhat of a big issue for, for the uh, superintendent to try to make sure that everything gets watered equally. Um, and recovery tactics, we use a few different things that have, we've proven that has proven to help for us. One of the big things we do is we, the superintendents will all granularly fertilize their greens a week before the airification. What that does is give them a good head start for uh, a week later when we are punching that they have plants already growing, it's already absorbed the nutrients, and it's in full growth mode. That always helps recover greens a little bit quicker. Another practice we use a lot is daily rolling. We'll actually get out in the morning, run a couple of uh, wraps around the sprinklers, and then we will roll with the roller every day for the first four, five, six days, just to make sure what if the putts on that half of the aerified half do roll smoothly. Uh, 
The other thing that uh, happens sometimes is it's careful to note how how fast you end up mowing that first that air, after the airification for the first time. If you will mow too quick, you're going to end up removing sand, and you'll have 20 or 30 pounds of sand in your baskets rather than, than turf. So rather than that, we try to remain remain off of mow, mowing green for about four or five, maybe six days, and just roll that half until it, it, uh, we see the sand working into the program. I'm going to go ahead now and show a little video on talking about uh, these cultural practices. So, and if any questions come from that, please be free to forward them. Cultural practices or maintenance of soil and turf are an important and necessary function of golf courses in order to maintain and promote healthy and manageable turf, which means better playing conditions and consistent grades. In order to have a smooth roll 95% of the year, there are certain cultural practices that must be done for 5% of the year. Greens can develop inconsistencies if soils, thatch, and root zone development are not managed properly through routine cultural practices. One of the most important cultural practices is the process of verification which relieves soil compaction. During the aerification process, mechanical tides create small holes in the turf, improving oxygen availability in the root zone. The influx of oxygen and release of carbon dioxide stimulates plant growth and aids in developing a stronger, healthier root zone. Turf density is also increased, meaning there are more plants per square foot, which vastly improves plant quality. The benefits of aerification include a consistent, smooth plant surface and greatly improve soil profile, allowing for a resilient healthy plant throughout the year. I also attended Timber Pines Country Club in Springfield, Florida to discuss verification and other cultural practices with Superintendent Robert Lieber. So we're at 85,000 rounds, which is a great amount of rounds compared to what we were probably six, seven years ago. Um, so the aerification aspect is is greatly needed. We aerify quite often here, and we aerify everything wall to wall. I try to do as best cultural practices as I possibly can, which includes bird gutting at least every other week on my champion greens. I try my best to keep the thatch at a, at a reasonable, possible, manageable height. I have a schedule from January 1st to December 31st, but that schedule changes more than 365 days a year. And it's, it's actually funny. The only thing that doesn't change are my big dates, you know, my verification dates. Our verification will get done three times a year. Um, and that's at least our teeth and grains. Our fairways, roughs, and any high compact areas, you know, in and out, so certain fairways are around teeth. They'll get done at, at least twice a year, um, and we do those as much as we possibly can during a weekly basis. Before we ever airify any greens, we double and sometimes triple bird cut our greens to get the thatch out. Then we pull the cores with our core harvester, and then we top dress, roll, brush it in. We want to be playable two weeks after we verify any of the golf courses, um, especially on the greens. As soon as our walk air fires get off, our 648s, we put them straight on the tees. We straight do our tees at a one and a half inch uh, setting, four inch speed. Um, our two fairway air fires go first thing Monday morning as well. They go as far as they possibly can, which on for the week that the one golf course will be closed, basically they can get anywhere between six and eight fairways done. And as far as our roughs go, we just use our airway verifier, the roll type verifier, except for along our car pass where we use our soil reliever and did five rows on each side of any playable or drivable turf where it gets so much compaction. And we go 10 inches deep with those. And basically we try to get it done by Wednesday and Thursday and Friday are clean up and set up for Saturday's opening. Every bit of how good 
that we stay 100% uh, grass on all our greens um, is attributed to all the culture practices that we do throughout the summer. We want the same things that anybody else wants. You know, we want the best playing conditions possible. But to do that, we literally need to do these cultural practices. I mean, it's the bottom line. Um, it's the future, and it'll stay that way for years to come. A couple of, excuse me, a couple of interesting facts about that is this course was in Florida, so you notice that their, their all their projects or airification was just done in the summer months. Uh, that's Bermuda grass greens, and I think uh, the key to any verification, the timing of verification, is when the plant is the healthiest. Here in California, with the uh, polar greens that we we have at most of our properties, uh, we look at uh, verifications. Uh, if we go three times, it would be early spring, late spring, and then in the early October in the fall. If we're doing just twice, we'll go uh, mid spring and early fall. The reason we really like to try to squeeze this, the airification in before the summer is that's the most uh, delicate point of the year for the poanium. Remember, we're growing cool season grass in warm climate, and the summer months can be very stressful. And we, we try to do is build up the root system as strong as we can get under the poa so it can handle the high temperatures and humidity and other disease pressures that we'll get uh, throughout the year. Uh, I've always been a fan of verification. I think it's, it's proven itself over the years. But I think uh, recently, I think I, I, we really received probably the, the strongest vote for the, the, the reasons of verification. Um, I don't know how many of you know the Cathedral Canyon Country Club in, in uh, Cathedral City. We manage for uh, the wealth property. And when we went in there to start the process, the management process, we evaluated the golf course and the greens uh, were uh, fairly sealed up. We were percolating at about 1.7 inches per hour. Uh, normal or not normal, but, but uh, I would say what you're shooting for, your goal would be about 12 to 12 and a half inches per hour of water percolating through the soil profile. We, uh, we found out we had a huge problem and, and had really struggled with the overseeded greens uh, last year. And so we went on a very strong aerification program uh, this past uh, this past summer, where we actually aerified three times within three months. And what was interesting is at the end of all that, our percolation rate went from 1.78 to 9.75 with three aerifications. And thus, we had a very successful year with the greens at Cathedral Canyon, and very excited about the progress we made. So. Uh, that example just speaks volumes as to how important it is to keep that drainage uh, moving through the soil profile and what airification can actually can actually do for you. Um, moving along, um, the next topic I wanted to discuss was uh, the uh, overseeding process against uh, what we're now seeing uh, a lot more in San Diego County is the uh, the actual painting of of, of turf and. Um, some of the things that you need to consider there are, first of all, is, is the cost, is the cost of each option. Uh, I know that uh, many of you have realized what the price of ryegrass has gone over a dollar a pound and uh, can result in about anywhere from sixty dollars to $100,000, depending on your seed rate, uh, especially for the private clubs in the desert area. Um, add to that the labor, uh, the water, um, and in the public side, any revenue loss that you'd have by having carts on the path in extremely wet conditions if you stay open. Uh, if you look at the cost that uh, we're looking at with some of the pigments now, we're looking in the area of about uh, $1,200 per application if you do uh, fairways and maybe tees if you don't oversee. So the cost is, 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 is astronomically different. Uh, in the public side, when we don't have to renovate the golf course in October, uh, which is a great a great weather month for us in San Diego County. Um, we experience ha much higher revenues. We don't have any limitations as to ca cart traffic. Uh, there's no overwatering. There's no uh, there's no spending of the of uh, extra dollars for for labor to do that. So it's just business as usual. When it changes, um, is it depends on what the course demands are. I know uh, for the guys out in the desert area. Uh, where the private courses or even most of the high-end public courses, there is that demand to uh, have that overseeded 
uh, look that the snowbirds and other people that come and visiting from other areas for the winter months, they want to have. So I don't think, I think slowly but surely, I think there were one or two courses this year in the desert that actually did paint. Um, and I think those were uh, probably uh, uh, lower end uh, pro uh, public courses at this time. Will it ever catch on? I don't know. It's going to depend a lot on what happens with water and what happens with, with seed pricing. But as you know, uh, that's going up and up in both areas. So I think that uh, the demand of your golf course or your property is really dictating to what you can what you can do and what you can get away with. I know at Cathedral Canyon we did oversee fairways and tees and left the roughs left the roughs alone. So um, the timing of each option is also something too is interesting. Um, overseeding usually occurs um, in October, uh, early October, and I know in the desert they shut the courses down for a month while they they overseed and bring in the new ryegrass. Um, so the whole month. If you're in San Diego, it's also done in October. Uh, most public courses will stay open and keep uh, cart restrictions to the path. Um, the conditions are less than optimal, obviously, with a lot of water that's pretty wet, uh, balls plug, and it gets a lot of negative feedback. Um, on the painting, what we have found is that we can move the painting back till the end of October uh, before the first frost. The reason that the manufacturers rep recommend doing that is that the paint actually or the pigment gets into the plant and when we do get to those first frost conditions which generally happen early November um, we still we already have the paint established and it holds the color much better uh, if you allow the plant to go completely dormant and spray um, chances are the the color it won't look nearly as uniform as it might as if you started earlier so we've actually gone to starting in the last week of October and uh, generally speaking um, we can get away with with two to three applications if we're painting uh, it takes uh, about uh, three to four weeks before you start to see uh, it grow out after mowing depending on the weather if it's still warm like it was in January this year uh, we ended up uh, having an extra application because uh, we actually mowed it off um, but typically speaking it's usually two to three applications of of the uh, pigment or paint um, then the argument is going to, is it pigment or is it paint, which is better to go? Well, on a cost basis, paint is much, much more expensive. However, paint, I think, has a more, uh, the color that resembles turf grass a little bit more. And I think that uh, most guys like the way that looks. However, again, it is much more expensive, probably close to double what you would pay for pigments. Um, today, though, I think they're working very hard. Manufacturers have been working very, very hard on the pigments, and I think we're seeing uh, the results coming where if you play with the rate a little bit, they have a they have a rate, but everybody's turf takes on a little bit different color as as you paint it or as you use the pigment. But we found that playing with the uh, the mix of how much we're using per acre, uh, and we've been able to solve it pretty good, and it actually looks pretty good. And with allowing the roughs to go dormant, we we get that good contrast where we can spray the edges of the fairways and actually make it look like target golf. So it's in our application it's worked very well for us. Um, here at Twin Oaks Golf Course, one of our courses in San Marcos, I remember the first year we decided we weren't gonna overseed, tees only. And um, we felt the effects of it uh, at the counter, people talking about dead fairways, dead grass, how come the place looks so bad? And we always have to remember that to the golfer, perception is reality. Uh, obviously the grass wasn't dead, it was dormant, but in their eyes, it was a point where it was not very aesthetically pleasing and they didn't, uh, they didn't enjoy it, and, and we had several feedback comments about it. The next year, the very next year, we decided to go to paint. And when we did the paint, it was interesting because I'd go in that same snack bar and hear guys saying, well, I don't know what they did this year, but uh, boy, is it nice to play that green grass again. I'm sure glad they, they put the effort into keeping grass growing. So this is, again, going back to the hunting back to the uh, perception versus reality. And that's how I think it's a big part of it is, is getting over that hurdle. The next area we'll touch on a little bit is called uh, identifying turf grass water stress. And I'd like to start this one with uh, watching a short video. Manager for Harold's. I'm here today to speak with you about insignificant water stress. 
what is the incipient water stress? Incipient is really just a fancy way of saying the initial sign of water stress. We're going to show you some examples with Bermuda graphs, and Austin graphs, some Bahia graphs, and also a little bit of another graph, bamboo, where it's a little bit more visible to see these issues. When you first see these, these signs, there's a little bit of a discoloration of the graphs. There's oftentimes people uh, say it's a grayish color or a bluish color to a turf, and some grasses even look a little purple. Well, we want to describe to you and show you why it is those colors exist and show you at the end potential solutions for those issues. Let's go outside and take a look. Okay, so here we are. We're looking at a piece of bamboo. Bamboo is a grass, as we know. I like to use bamboo because the leaves are much larger than finely mowed turf grass. And so the issues with water, the issues with nutrients are much easier to see. You'll see the same issues as far as leaf curling and even with nutrient deficiency as you will with turf grass, but it's so much easier to see as you see here that leaf is, is curled up while the other leaves are open up. It, you're going to see this in the other turf grass. When bamboo or any grass senses water stress, it curls that leaf up to conserve water. And when it does so, the transpiration rate reduces, the water in the plant is, is conserved, and then when it senses that the water stress in the soil is relieved, then it'll open that leaf back up. And oftentimes you'll see this occur in the late afternoon, and in the morning time, the leaf will be wide open in the late afternoon, and the leaf will be curled up and closed, even if you haven't irrigated. Okay, so here you see a, a really good example of the underneath side of the bamboo leaf where it's a different color of green. It's a, it's a different shade of green that you can kind of envision if there's millions of these little leaf blades in an area and they're all a little bit of a lighter colored green or grayish color. You can see how that area would look a little off color or, or, or bluish or grayish depending on the other side of the leaf. And that's why the differences in, in color with different turf grasses because grass may have a different color. It may respond in a different way than, you know, say, tip dwarf or St. Austin grass. Okay, here we are in a residential area where the swell, the space between the sidewalk and the road is showing leaf curling, showing water stress. And this is a good example because right next to the sidewalk, it's not dry. And that is because the irrigation from the lawn is running across the sidewalk and providing water to the turf right along the sidewalk. But if you just move over maybe a foot, the turf in the exact same area is showing signs of drought stress. And that's because this swell here is not irrigated. So here's the icing grass right next to the sidewalk. And we're going to show a similar example of what we just saw with bamboo, but it's going to become increasingly more challenging to determine that leaf curling influence, that drought stress, because the leaf blades on this grass are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so here's a normal thing. I've grass leaf blade. It's opened up. It's transpiring at a, at a normal rate. It's, it believes it's in a healthy situation, but literally six inches away, pull a leaf blade out, and we have the exact same species, exact same side of leaf, actually. And one is curled up, very little transpiration going on, and one is wide open. The reason for that is, as I explained earlier, the moisture next to the sidewalk is higher, and the moisture just only inches away due to the variation in the irrigation of this area. And you can see if you try to open it up, I mean, it's, it's curled up. You could get your fingers down there and start to poke these loop blades up. It'll open right up, and it'll be the same size leaf as the one that's already open. Okay, so here we are with, with Bermuda grass. This is 419. You see the leaf blade right here is completely open. It's in the middle of the afternoon, 2 o'clock, and it's growing full speed. The transpiration is great. The turf believes it's in good health. Now, literally, without even moving a foot over, we start to see a little bit of a different color to the turf. This grayish appearance occurs, and, and there is a little bit of physiology involved with the plant as far as the color, and there is some movement of nutrients in some cases, you know, especially in severe cases. But in these incipient cases, the color change is simply due to that leaf growing. You see that here where the leaf blade that you saw just previous is a foot over was wide open. These are the same leaf blades, but they're curled up. And we see these little needles or pins, and it manifests itself in that color change. Okay, so this, this area is what I would consider to be incipient water stress. As we move over a couple feet into this zone that I've turned off, we get to an area that is a little bit past that incipient water stress. It's beyond just leaf curl. At this point, there are some physiological things going on. The grass is actually beginning to fade to yellow. It's more than likely beginning to translocate nutrients from the leaves to other parts of the plant to stay alive. When you see this occur, parts of this turf probably won't survive simply reapplying water. That incipient water stress is simply a case of putting water on there, making sure the water is uniformly distributed in the soil, and it'll pop right back. But this part here is severe. Parts of this actually will die uh, because it's beyond that incipient water stress. So here we see a, a little bit broader shot of a home lawn here, where if you look 
about halfway down, you'll see where that grass is a little bit of a grayish hue to it, where around the grass, around that little area, there's a, there's a darker green color to the turf, and that's, that's what we're referring to when we refer to these you know, grayish blue areas. The important part is recognizing that that is incipient water stress and understanding the solution is simply applying the water. We don't need to go out and be applying insecticides and fungicides and all these things if that's not the problem. The hay grass is a very drought tolerant turf species, but it can also show these signs as you see here. This area has not received any irrigation. There's no good irrigation in this area, and it has not rained here for several weeks. And this is what it looks like with the exact same appearance. This is actually a pretty broad case of it as you see here, but it's the same exact issue where leaf curling. And in fact, a week later when it rained, these areas popped right back and you wouldn't be able to see this at all. So here's an example of a very drought tolerant turf species also showing that symptom of incipient water stress. In summary, incipient water stress can often be seen by these grayish, bluish tints to turf grasses. This can be caused by hydrophobic soil conditions so that when you water the soil, it's not actually completely water in the soil in your turf grass. To alleviate hydrophobic soil conditions, please refer to the next video in our series, Wetting Agents, where we show the value of using wetting agents in hydrophobic conditions. Thank you for watching. So this, uh, this area of uh, turf graph water stress is, is very important to golf course superintendents, uh, and especially superintendents that are managing public greens. And as we come into the summer months, when we get into the critical stages of, of keeping the plant alive, it's very important to be able to identify this on the early stages before we get into a situation where we can actually lose plants and uh, cause lots of turf, which is, which is a big problem. Um, a couple of things that we, we use uh, religiously on the golf courses with our group is uh, moisture meters, where first thing in the morning, the superintendent will head out uh, and check his greens by using the moisture meter. We use a field scout by uh, Spectrum Technologies, which is a very, very accurate reading. And what they will do is they will take uh, several spots on every green and check the moisture level. And they'll know at eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning what levels they're at and then can anticipate where they'll be by two, three, four o'clock during the heat of the day. Um, and if they see that their levels might be high already, that they may be needing water, they'll actually hand water even before any signs of stress come because we know uh, by the afternoon, if we do know nothing, we'll end up with uh, some, drought, some high drought stress spots. Uh, another tool that we've been successful with is when we get into extreme heat, uh, when we want to look at syringing the polar greens in the afternoon. And we have a, uh, what we have is our turf thermometers where it actually has a, a, like a, a laser beam that shoots the grass plant and it'll tell you what the temperature reading is. And what we find is any time that we get into the 90s, the mid 90s to the high 90s, that plant's under stress, it needs water. Uh, we'll, like, we'll come back out and syringe that uh, and get some, uh, get some moisture on it and right away it, the, the, the plant will uh, really recover quickly and, 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 be, and cool it down to the temperatures it needs. Some days we, we actually end up syringing twice if it gets extremely hot. So that syringing is very, very important. One of the things we also do uh, is we try to use a hose rather than sprinkler, sprinkler heads. Uh, the hose can really there's no better uh, there's no better control on where the water is going than with a, a, someone out uh, hand watering that spot that might need it or lightly syringing the water. Sometimes the sprinkler heads take a couple of minutes to to turn, and by that time you put the water in a lot of different places. You really don't need it. So we really encourage the guys using hoses for their syringing. Um, the dry areas and turf diseases, which really is the most important part. Uh, what we have found is that when dry conditions exist. Uh, that's the opportunity and going to drought stress is when a lot of your major uh, fungus diseases will jump in, um, such as anthracnose or summer patch. Both those diseases key on dry areas. The plant gets weakened and the plant and the, and the uh, disease is in the soil. It has a chance to jump into the root system and affect the plant. And unfortunately, once you get these type of diseases in the summer, you're usually fighting those for the entire summer until uh, soil temperatures cool off in the fall. Uh, and tracnose is a prolific, uh, pro proficient disease that really can work hard on the system of the plant and cause a, a lot of instability, a lot of, a lot of plant loss and can really uh, destroy a green in, in a matter of time. 
and we apply fungicides to it to to stop its pr uh, progression. But uh, once it's active, it, it is very hard to completely kill until the uh, soil temperatures will cool off and it will it will move out move out. The next section I'd like to touch on is called the diagnosing the soil profiles. And again, I've got a short video I'd like you to see regarding that. Examining the turf surface for no symptoms on leaves and stems. Diagnosing turf ailments is usually conducted by examining the turf surface for noticeable symptoms on leaves and stems. Above ground symptoms, however, can result from causal factors that exist below ground in the root zone. Examining only the exposed above ground turf without investigating the root zone may never lead to the true cause of a plant stress or decline. Investigating a root zone requires the use of proper tools and techniques. A soil profiling device is ideal as this tool helps to remove a wide and clean sample from the root zone for examination. The proper technique for using the soil profiling tool requires uniform pressure and smooth operation so as not to create any undesirable artificial features not inherent to the soil profile under examination. The soil profile also provides a great opportunity to examine the root zone for obstructions or undesirable layering. This type of layering can result from heavy, infrequent top dressing rates, utilization of top dressing sand that has a particle size distribution which differs from the original size from which the root zone was constructed, and excessive organic matter accumulation. The formation of undesirable layers within the soil profile can lead to the development of negative soil profile conditions such as black layer, which results from poor water movement leading to the anaerobic conditions and the buildup of harmful gases, which disrupt root zone development and function. Layering can also result from repeated aerification or cultural practice at only one depth. This can result in the formation of a hard pan, which also restricts water and air exchange. Utilizing poor aerification equipment at variable depths will help to prevent the formation of a hard pan condition. In summary, soil profile examination is a great way to help diagnose turf health problems visible on the surface. Using the proper tools and techniques helps maximize the potential to determine causal factors and conditions which can lead to turf decline. Finally, employing proper aerification techniques plays an important role in modifying undesirable root zone characteristics. So you can see that the uh, the problems of, of a lot of greens will start underneath this into the soil rather than on top uh, that uh, will end up causing problems on the top. So it's early diagnosis of the soil conditions that can really help create a, a very high standard growing medium for the grass and make your greens a lot healthier year round. As one of the things we saw on the slide was the black layer, which is really imposed mostly by uh, sometimes poor irrigation practices where the greens get too wet, the compaction lays on, and all of a sudden the water starts to not drain through the soil. It'll actually form this layer of black color, uh, which is an anaerobic condition where there's no oxygen whatsoever because the compaction is so tight and will actually uh, really lead itself to uh, make itself available for a lot of diseases to jump in and or just root uh, uh, desiccation due to the black layer and lack of oxygen. Um, the other one we saw in the slide in the video was the uh, thick organic layering or the thatch. And the problem with thatch is, is twofold. One, it, it does stop uh, drainage, it, it restricts drainage, and it holds the moisture in that thatch layer, which is a, just an absolute host or a breeding ground for, for turf fungus. And it's very important to control that as far as just for the overall health of the plant and this putting quality. I think that's the other thing is that uh, uh, heavy thatch screens become puffy. Uh, they, uh, the ball will actually end up bouncing a little bit more and not roll as true when the thatch levels are high. Um, the last section is the last bullet point, the top dressing material selection. Uh, basically what you'd like to always do is match whatever the greens are built out of. If they are built out of a a sand base uh, 
with uh, the gradations, you'd want to match that with your top dressing so you're not interfacing and adding another different layer of soil to it that can create some barriers to drainage and eventually affect the health of the turf. Uh, in the case of push-up greens, you may end up with uh, a lot more selection availability because um, nothing's probably going to be as, as, as thick and tight as what uh, the loam or the loamy soil or whatever they built the greens out of originally. So it's important to be able to select the right material just for the overall health of the greens. We turn to the next section, we call it our GCM checkbook. And this is something that uh, JC superintendents all use and are responsible for. Um, if you look below, you can see the, the uh, chart of accounts, which is actually, this one happens to be golf operations. But each purchase that they make, they'll follow uh, and log it into their checkbook. So they're aware of where they're spent, where they're spending is uh, happening each month, under what category, and what they've made, and according to their budget and according to their plan. Um, the guys are all pretty well versed into that because they know uh, at any point in time I may give them a call and say, you know, how are we doing on chemical budget this month? Where are we at? And they 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 will know they'll know exactly what they spend. Um, it's hard to uh, be a, accountable for a budget when at the end of the month you find out what you spent. We like to make sure that our guys are up to speed and ready uh, to answer any kind of, of uh, financial questions in their categories uh, on demand. So it really helps the superintendent, I think, take uh, take part in being uh, watching his expenses and being aware of what monies are being spent on the golf course. Um, the plan is usually based on an actual plan, which, which uh, we'll devise at the beginning of the year and, and talk about every month what, what we plan for fertilizer and chemical controls, whether it's weeds or f uh, pre preventative fungus uh, applications. Um, it, it, it touches on each category and we, we do that historically. We work off one historically, knowing where we were, knowing where we we're gonna be the next year. Uh, reflecting in price increases and different areas that are going up, such as fuel and, and obviously labor these days. Um, and then at the end of the month, uh, the accounting department sends out a general ledger in which all of the superintendents will go back through uh, and read every purchase that was made based on uh, the results of the general ledger that ends up in the financial statement. So they will be able to question any invoice that may be in there that may not belong to them or uh, sometimes it, it could even be a duplication, but they are fully aware of what they've spent and they're checking just to make sure that those financial reports will be, will be accurate. The last section we're going to talk about briefly is just the budget review and reforecasting. Uh, JCS to JC Resorts, we actually call our budgets dynamic. Now, they're dynamic budgets, they're static budgets. Static budgets are basically the ones that you formulate uh, maybe October, November of the prior year, where you're, you're kind of discussing what the uh, budget's going to look like, what you anticipate spending, and um, how that all works is, is based on mostly historical uh, uh, figures of what we've done in the past and what we plan to do in the future. But when the budgets actually come out in the dynamic, um, let's say January comes out and we experience two to three inches of rain in a week, and all of a sudden revenues are down, our budget becomes dynamic. We start talking about what can we do uh, to start to uh, work on it, which leads into the next point of flex spending. Um, we use flexible spending based on revenues coming in. If, we're, if we see that uh, rain or some other uh, factor has diminished our anticipated revenues, um, we'll look at every category in the superintendent budget to see what we can uh, delay or, or cut to uh, to reduce those expenses to try to stay on our, our financial plan. And I think that uh, uh, the superintendents actually become a little bit more of a business person because they're looking at um, these costs and trying to figure out what they can delay or what we might have to remove from the budget. Sometimes we are able to move an application of fertilizer back a couple of weeks, knowing that, hey, this month's gonna be a little bit tougher, but next month's projections look good, tournaments uh, book look really strong, so I think we can take a look at um, putting that application back in. So just to recap, I think this morning we just talked about the, some areas and, and I, a lot of different areas touched on just to uh, give a different perspective of where things are. The golf maintenance business is 
is ever changing, as I said earlier. I think it's one that's uh, it's gotten to uh, be an effect from different, many very variables. A lot to do with agencies, state agencies requiring um, whether it's uh, APCD, the Air Pollution Quality or Control District, uh, whether it's fishing game, whether it's uh, uh, if you're close to the close, close to the close to the coast. Sorry, uh, the Coastal Commission. Um, these agencies have put a lot of reporting responsibilities on us and also uh, have limited some of the uh, uh, applications we can make to, to, to the turf. So we're working on all that. That seems to be the thing uh, that's happening now. Uh, for example, the city of Encinitas has now banned Roundup, so we no longer can use that. And we probably see more of that coming down the line. So the business is changing. Uh, the superintendents work really hard to uh, fulfill the golf course conditions that we're all looking for. And uh, as everybody knows, it's, it's a challenging industry right now, and we're working uh, very hard to uh, stay competitive and, and still uh, be, be profitable in our operations. That concludes uh, my talk for this morning. Um, certainly, I, I want to thank everybody for their time and, and listening in. If there's any questions, again, we'd be, we'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much, Mr. Dobeck. Um, a few questions that have come in. Uh, in terms of, you know, it's, it's a real, it seems to be a real balancing act with rising water costs and rising labor and the increasing uh, competition of the market in terms of value for the customers. Everyone's got a bet, you know, everyone, is, is constantly in a, in a rat race for the best deal, online booking engines uh, included. How, uh, how do we address as managers and golf professionals, how do we address ways to effectively accomplish uh, tasks that improve uh, playing ability, but at the same time, um, are wise on our uh, water and labor expenses, particularly in terms of verticutting, rough mowing, um, and general green speed conditions. Yeah, well, I, at JC Resorts, uh, my theory has always been strength down the middle. I've been part of athletic teams my whole life, and whenever you think about basketball, you've got a great center. You think about hockey, you've got good centers, good goaltending. Football, you've got good quarterbacks all your strength, baseball, middle infielders, we like to think of our goals of always being strength down the middle, starting out with our greens, our fairways, and our tees. Those are the areas that we really concentrate. And of course, first would be greens. If, you, if the greens are in good condition, um, a lot of people will still enjoy playing the golf course as long as they know that the, the, those conditions are good. The fairways should be good and the tees should be good as well. As far as combating uh, 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 any kind of cultural practices that you do. You know, we've done some things now. We're trying different things. We start to uh, uh, do some verticutting in the afternoons versus the mornings if we can get, if we can work it in. We've worked some split shifts where guys uh, come back in the afternoons or even start late during the day so they can stay later and accomplish some of these tasks that don't interfere with play. Um, those are the kind of things that you, you, it's, it's constantly changing. It's constantly trying to reinvent new ways. It certainly is challenging. I will certainly agree with the online booking agencies and, and people, you know, what their loyalty is like these days compared to what it used to be. Um, they are looking for the best deal and they're willing to go wherever it is. So it's these kind of things that, that you know, cause us to look at airifying half greens, uh, doing things that, that, that keep our facility still in good shape as we go through these maintenance practices. But as that slide had showed, uh, one of our videos, 95% of the time we can have great conditions, but 5% of the time we'll have to do some renovation work to the golf course. But I agree it's a battle we do all the time. John McNair and myself here at JC are constantly talking about ways of, of how can we do things uh, quicker, better, cheaper, and still provide the product that the golfer, golfer looks at. And I think you're going to see as time goes on, there's going to be a lot of changes to how things are done, what level things are done to, and I think that's, that's because of the price of water, because of the price of labor, uh, as we all know, the profit margins are dwindling, and it's tough to stay in business. So, uh, well, along those same lines, would you advocate for uh, uh, 
a, a maintenance operation that verticuts greens um, lightly, and which is to say they just tickle them a little bit. They verticut greens lightly once a week. Um, and then of course that incurs more labor. Would you be an advocate of verticutting once every other week and just going deeper and more aggressive on the verticut and then chasing it with some, some fertilizing uh, afterwards? Yeah. And, and the, along the same lines, if you could speak a little bit about that same uh, program and philosophy in terms of rough mowing, you know, taking the rough down to a lower height so that you could only you only have to mow it once a week as opposed to twice a week at, a, at another height. Um, can you talk a little bit about that creative creativity and and uh, yeah. the balance between those 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 efforts? Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer, and I, I'd like to we like to to uh, when we verticut we like to we like to actually accomplish something. I think sometimes um, if you go at light rates, you're really not doing anything. Again, with cost of labor and everything. I'm more of an advocate of verticutting every other week at, at a deeper depth and sand top dressing below. And maybe you pick out a, a, a slower day that would, would, uh, would we know your, your golf rounds might not be as high. If it's a private club, it might be a Monday. If it's a public course, Monday, Tuesday. Some of those times when it's least affecting the amount of play. But again, I think going out and, and tickle them, and, I, and it a little bit depends on what type of turf you have. If you have bent grass greens, you know, the grooming helps because you're, you're cutting some of that lateral growth and maintaining, trying to get more upright growth is what we're all after. Uh, when you're looking at POA, you're trying to thin the plants out because as they become thicker, uh, it affects the uh, the friction on the ball and, and slows down speeds and, and doesn't really, uh, and creates some bumpy conditions. As far as the roughs go, yeah, I think that, you know, for one of the, as we all know, one of the biggest complaints always is speed of play. When the roughs get up to the point where, People are hunting for golf balls and, and looking longer longer time. Um, it, it slows down the game. I don't think it's as comfortable for people to play. We really feel like some of our more successful golf courses are the ones that people can go out and play and enjoy playing and score well and have fun. And some of that is is, is rough cutting height because the lower you can cut them, the easier it can be um, for them to play out of it. And I think that you know keeping them at a lower height or at a lower height makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. And I think that uh, the only thing you might lose is a little bit of definition between your fairway and your rough, but you can still keep that margin where it looks a little bit different. But I would agree that keeping the roughs a little bit lower uh, would promote quicker play and also maybe save on some of the labor because you don't have to cut it at once. You might have to go back and cut it twice if you're cutting it at two inches or above. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Dobeck. Uh, those are all the questions that we have uh, this morning on uh, this week's Catalyst. I would like to, on behalf of the Southern California PGA uh, Section Education Committee, I want to thank uh, Mr. Dobeck for his time and effort in, uh, in uh, giving us this morning to educate us on uh, golf course maintenance practices. Um, as always, the uh, Catalyst webinar uh, quiz will be going out here shortly. It's a 10 question quiz. Please take the quiz and return it to Sharon Kerfman, S. Kerfman at PGAHQ.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR for uh, one MSR point for uh, for attending this morning. Uh, we will also be sending out the uh, the YouTube recording of uh, this morning's catalyst. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us, Mr. Dobek, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, and everybody have a great day.